to the Kent Lap Podcast. If I were counseling a couple or a pastor trying to start a multi ethnic church, there are a couple things. The first thing I would recommend is um, that they would be, um, uh, you've got to be, um, you've got to choose in the very beginning of your church plant um, uh, uh, people of color to lead with um, that have just as much authority as you have as the senior pastor, if you're a white guy. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I would say the same thing for a black pastor who is wanting to start a multi I would say you got to go get a white guy, mm. Asian cat, Hispanic, some it's because you want, um, you want your heart. You want the, the goal of that church to be represented by your leadership. Yes. And so you, you've got to be intentional first about um, your leadership. And that's um, if you have an elder led church, your elders have to be diverse um, because you need to have different perspectives at that leadership table as you're making decisions for your congregation. So you got to be intentional about um, leadership. You've got to be intentional about growing the church um, multi ethnically. Is that a word? I think so. Right. You got to be, you got to be intentional about growing that church that way. Right. And so again, that, that leads me to my other point that I made earlier. Um, you can't have people come to your church from different cultures and ask them to assimilate to white culture. You've got to have them come and accommodate their culture. Right. So we used to say at the church that I I pastored in, in, uh, in, in Conway, bring your cultures um, but don't leave them at the door, mm. right? Like, so we bring all of our cultures and we submit to the cross culture mm-hmm. um, is what we used to always say. Mm. And so, um, so I want, you know, I wanted, um, we had a, a, a lady from Africa, from Ghana, who was at our church and um, used to love her. And I would always love the fact that she would always wear her Ghanaian get regalia to mm-hmm. church, right? And I'm like, don't change that. You know, you be you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so, and we had a little bit of everything in our church. I loved my church in Conway, um, uh, because it was, it, it was so representative of our community, but that was because we were intentional. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a diverse leadership team. Um, we were accommodating to the cultures that came to our church. Um, the other thing that I would say, um, is, um, you've got to encourage, well, first as the pastor you have to develop cross-cultural relationships first. Like, you're not going to do this if you're not consistently developing cross-cultural relationships. Yeah. Personally, as the pastor. Exactly. Yep. Right. And then you can begin to ask your congregation to be intentional about developing cross-cultural relationships. Yeah. Right? Because what does that do? That then develops cross-cultural competence, right? Because now that I am engaging with you, it's part of the reason why we still have these lynchings like we had in Georgia last, last week. Why? Because um, I, I, I would venture to say that those gentlemen don't have close-knit relationships with African-Americans. I was thinking the same thing. I don't know that to be true. Yeah. I'm just... I'd bet some money on that. Um, so so why, is, why is the development of cross-cultural relationships so important? Because as I'm developing relationships with my person of color or with my white friend, with my Hispanic friend, with my Asian friend, as we're having discussions, I'm beginning to get a different perspective on their perspective. Like, right. So instead of uh, believing racist ideas that I've assumed just because that's part of the culture of America, um, I now look at my African-American friend a little differently. I now look at the issue of um, universal health care a little differently now because I see the disparities that mm-hmm. African-American people have had to go through over the years. Mm-hmm. I've, I see the policies that were put in place where we were never able to gain what most of white America has. Mm-hmm. So I do see a reason for universal health care to make sure these people are taken care of. Maybe I don't uh, uh, necessarily understand that if I don't have relationships, if I'm not engaging consistently with people in the African-American community or the Hispanic community, Mm -hmm. right? Um, You know, I I can, I can, 
I can kind of shrug off what's going on at the border because I'm only hearing from whichever news channel I'm listening to um, because I have no Hispanic friends. Yes. I have no friends who came here from Mexico, so I can't sit down with them and say, so why did you, why did you make that dangerous trip to get here? And they can tell me, man, my family was in trouble, right? Uh, the cartels were ruling the streets, and I cannot raise my family. I get that. Mm-hmm. I completely get that. Mm-hmm. I would do the same thing, yeah. right? And so that changes my perspective on how I view these political issues that have been coming up, right? And so as a pastor, if I'm developing cross-cultural relationships, if I'm engaging with other cultures consistently, then even as I'm preaching my messages, I'm incorporating their life experiences into my messages as well. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking them to assimilate to the way um, of the world for white people. I'm, I'm, I'm still addressing my mm-hmm. white congregation, but I'm also saying now for my people of color, right? Um, if I'm not engaged with those communities, I don't even know when I'm sitting down preparing my message that, okay, because, you know, um, as a speaker, right, as a, a person who's making us be learning this in college, know your audience, right? Yeah. And so if I know my audience, I know who's out there, then as I'm making points in my sermon, then I'm making a point for my white congregation. I'm making a point for, I'm addressing everybody, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then my congregation, as I'm creating small groups, I'm making sure my small groups are diversified, mm-hmm. right? So conversations at the dinner table, I think that's the most important thing. If mm-hmm. I can sit down with you at my dinner table and we can have those difficult conversations where sometimes we might leave that table, man, a little angry with one another um, or like, man, I can't believe he believes that. Right. But it's those conversations that get you to a place where, man, I know my brother. I know where he stands. Man, we disagree on this issue here. Yeah. But that's my man. Right. Yep. And so now when I'm with my white friends or I'm with my black friends, uh, and, and a comment is made, I'm like, come on, man. No, I, I know them. Mm, uh, mm-hmm. At least I know this brother and his family. Yep. And they are not like that. So yep. I, don't know, I don't know where you get that stereotype from. I, actually, I, I do know where you get it from. Yep. But it's not true of all mm-hmm. of, of African-American culture. Because mm-hmm. there are different. So of the ethnic group of African-Americans, there are various cultures within the African-American community. Just like there are various cultures within the white community. Mm-hmm. Various cultures. Within, so you can't, you can't put a label on an entire ethnic group yeah. based upon what you've heard about. Well, that's a great point. My wife was raised Amish, and okay. she's white. Her okay. parents are white. Mm-hmm. Obvi- well, not obviously, but right. I don't know if there's any black Amish. But um, mm-hmm. <laughs> So anyhow, mm-hmm. my point being, though, um, she, now she looks like anyone else. Okay. But she was raised Amish. Uh-huh. She was a white lady, but right. she was raised Amish. That's right. a very, very particular niche sort of culture mm-hmm. that you're raised Absolutely. in. Absolutely. If you're visiting a church, what are some things that are going to make you comfortable or uncomfortable then as a black man? Um, or maybe put another way, if you are starting to uh, visit a church uh, and potentially going to want to start attending there, that's probably a better one, mm-hmm. because uh, I don't know that anyone's comfortable visiting a church. <laughs> <laughs> that's got to be one of the worst things. <laughs> that's messed up, though, man, because it should be the complete opposite. It right? should, you should be, but yeah. I, dude, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't get know. You. It's, 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 it's awkward visiting new churches, I yeah, feel yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, we were doing that when, when I was planting in Northern Virginia, because we had our core group meetings on Sunday evenings. Oh, so okay, what we would yeah. do is I would invite our, my, our core group and we would visit various churches in the area on yep. Sunday mornings okay. before we had our Sunday gathering in the evening. And it yep. was, man, woo, it, yeah. it, was, it was a trip. Cause I had, yep. you know, I was pastoring for nine years at Strong Tower here in Franklin before moving there. So mm-hmm. I, I was, I was at Strong Tower every Sunday. Gotcha. So I, had, I, yes. I didn't have an yep. opportunity to visit other churches, but man, it was an experience, boy, yeah, to I tell you the it. least. But I think what I would look for um, number one, I would look for where's the diversity. As soon as I walk in, I want to see is anybody here look mm-hmm. like me, mm-hmm. um, or is there are there any Hispanics? Are there um, and uh, are there any people of color? And a substantial amount. Like I'm not talking about two, three families over here, mm-hmm. um, but that would be big for me. Um, I would want to know um, what the pastor's perspective is on the issue of race, like. Does he even have a perspective? Uh, does he even never? Does he ever deal with this issue? 
right? Um, I would love to know if um, how many pastors actually said something about this whole issue going on in Georgia this past Sunday. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, did you even address it? Or is it just some, is it so far out of your wheelhouse and out of the wheelhouse of your members that it's just kind of business as usual? Yeah. You know, I would want to know that if something like that happened, would you address it, you know, um, publicly with your people? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, music, obviously, um, you know, I recognize, man, that not many churches know how to mix up music like that. It's hard. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, yeah. You know, we we were um, we were blessed at Strong Tower um, because we had number one. We we're in Nashville, so you had musicians who were just—I mean, they're right. just good, right? Yeah. Um, but we also had musicians who knew how to blend musical genres, and so mm-hmm. man, we had a little bit of everything. Um, and when I first came to Strong Tower, I came from a traditionally African American church, mm. um, and so you know, I had to learn to love CCM music. I had never. I I didn't know anybody in CCM, um, but I learned to love that kind of worship as well. What's CCM? Um, contemporary? Contemporary Christian music. Oh, uh, right? okay. Yeah, so, you know. Well, uh, you weren't missing a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get in trouble, man. We're in Nashville. <laughs> so, this is the home of Christian yeah, music. That's right. A lot of it's not very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but, you know, man, you learn to love, and we used to tell our people, you know, um, we recognize that this Sunday may not be the Sunday where you hear your favorite type of Christian music, but man, thank God that your brother or your sister is hearing their kind of music today. Mm. Um, oh yeah, that's a good way to think about yeah. it. Yeah. And, uh, and then sometimes we would bring them together. We would mix a little CCM with black gospel and we'd have a choir. And so, I mean, we learned to do it the right way. And, but I don't know if many churches even know that that's necessary if they are looking to be a multi-ethnic church. Yeah. And so I would, I would look for the leadership. I would see, man, are there any people of color in their leadership? Mm -hmm. Are they just sitting like on the sidelines or are they up? Like, are they visible? Mm -hmm. Um, I would look for all of those things. And so, um, you know, it would be difficult because you don't, those are not, those kinds of churches are not prevalent. They are there. Right. Yeah. And they are growing in the country. Um, but you still, I mean, especially here in the South, it's just, um, it's not something that you see often. 